Chapter Four of Stella Fragelius by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Four. Mary preaches and the Colonel prevails. A fortnight had gone by, and during this time Morris was a frequent visitor at Seaview. Also his cousin Mary had come over twice or thrice to lunch, with her father or without him. Once, indeed, she had stopped all afternoon, spending most of it in the workshop with Morris. This workshop, it may be remembered, was the old chapel of the Abbey, a very beautiful and still perfect building finished in early Tudor times, in which by good fortune the rich stained glass of the east window still remained. It made a noble and spacious laboratory, with its wide nave and lovely roof of chestnut wood, whereof the corbels and serifs white-robed and golden-ringed. "'Are you not afraid to desecrate such a place with your horrid devices? "'I mean the iron things, the furnace and the litter?' "'Asked Mary. "'She had sunk down upon an anvil on which lay a newspaper, "'the first seat that she could find, "'and thence surveyed the strange, incongruous scene. "'Well, if you ask me—' "'I don't like it,' answered Morris. "'But there is no other place that I can have, "'for my father is afraid of the forge in the house, "'and I can't afford to build a workshop outside. "'It ought to be restored,' said Mary, "'with a beautiful organ in a carved case "'and a lovely alabaster altar, "'and one of those perpetual lamps of silver.' Uh, the French call them velouses, don't they? And the stations of the cross in carved oak, and all the rest of it. Mary, it may be explained, had a tendency to admire the outward adornments of ritualism, if not its doctrines. Quite so, answered Morris, smiling. When I have from five to seven thousand to spare, I will set out about the job, and hire a high church chaplain with a fine voice to come, and say mass for your benefit. Oh, by the way, would you like a confessional also? You omitted it from your list. I think not. Besides, what on earth should I confess, except being always late for prayers, through oversleeping myself in the morning? and general uselessness. Oh, I dare say you might find something if you tried, suggested Morris. Speak for yourself, please, Morris. To begin with your own account, there is the crime of sacrilege in using a chapel as a workshop. Look, those are all tombstones of abbots and other holy people, and under each tombstone one of them is asleep. Yet there you are, using strong language and whistling, and making a horrible noise with hammers, just above their heads. I wonder they don't haunt you. I would, if I were they. Oh, perhaps they do, said Morris, only I don't see them. Then they can't be there. Why not? Because things are invisible and intangible, it does not follow that they don't exist as I ought to know as much as any one. Of course, but I am sure that if there were anything of that sort about, you would soon be in touch with it. With me it is different. I could sleep sweetly with ghosts sitting on my bed in rows. Why do you say that? About me, I mean, asked Morris in a more earnest voice. Oh, I don't know. Go and look at your eyes in the glass. But I dare say you often look. 
"'Look here, Morris, you think me very silly, well, almost foolish, don't you?' "'I never thought anything of the sort. As a matter of fact, if you want to know, I think you are a young woman rather more idle than most, and with a perfect passion for burying your talent in a very white napkin.' "'Well, it all comes to the same thing, for there isn't much difference between fool-born and fool-manufactured.' Sometimes I wake up, however, and have moments of wisdom. As when I made you hear that thing, you know, thereby proving that it is all right, only useless, haven't I? I dare say, but come to the point. Oh, don't be in a hurry. It is rather hard to express myself. What I mean is that you had better give up staring. "'Staring? I never stared at you or, or anything in my life.' "'Stupid, Morris. By staring I mean star-gazing, and by star-gazing I mean trying to get away from the earth. In your mind, you know.' Morris rang his fingers through his untidy hair and opened his lips to answer. "'Don't contradict me,' she interrupted in a full, steady voice. "'That's what you are thinking of half the day, and dreaming about all the night.' "'What's that?' he ejaculated. "'I don't know,' she answered, with a sudden access of indifference. "'Do you know yourself?' "'I am waiting for instruction,' said Morris sarcastically. "'All right, then, I'll try. "'I mean that you are not satisfied with this world "'and those of us who live here. "'You keep trying to fashion another. "'Oh, yes, you have been at it from a boy. "'You see, I have got a good memory. "'I remember all your vision stories. "'And then you try to imagine its inhabitants. "'Well,' said Morris, with a sudden air of a convicted criminal, without admitting one word of this nonsense, what if I do? Only that you had better look out that you don't find whatever it is you seek. It's a horrible mistake to be so spiritual, at least in that kind of way. You should eat and drink and sleep ten hours as I do, and not go craving for visions till you can see, and praying for power until you can create. See? Create? Who? What? The inhabitant or inhabitants. Just think, you may have been building her up all this time, imagination by imagination, and thought by thought. Then her day might come, and all that you have put out piecemeal will return at once. Yes, she may appear, and take you, and possess you, and lead you. She! Why she? And where? Oh, to the devil, I imagine, answered Mary composedly. And as you are a man, one can guess the guide's sex. Oh, it's getting dark. Let's go out. This is such a creepy place in the dark that it actually makes me understand what people mean by nerves. Oh, and Morris, of course, you understand that I have only been talking rubbish. I always liked inventing fairy tales. You taught me, only this one is too grown up, disagreeable. What I really mean is that I, I do think it might be a good thing if you wouldn't live quite so much alone, and would go out a bit more. You are getting quite an odd look on your face. You are indeed, not like other men at all. I believe that it comes from your worrying about this wretched invention until you are half crazy over the thing. Any change there? He shook his head. No, I can't find the right alloy, not one that can be relied upon. I begin to doubt whether it exists. 
oh why don't you give it up for a while at any rate i have i made a novel kind of electric handsaw this spring and sold the patent for a hundred pounds and royalty there's commercial success for you and now i'm at work on a new lamp of which i have the idea i am uncommonly glad to hear it said mary with energy and i say morris you are not offended by my silly parables are you you know what i mean oh not a bit i think it is very kind of you to worry your head about an impossible fellow like me and look here mary i have done some dreaming in my time it is true for so far the world has been a place of tribulation to me and it is sick hearts that dream but i mean to give it up for i know as well as you do that there is only one end to all these systems of mysticism mary looked up i mean he went on correcting himself to the mad attempt unduly and prematurely to cultivate our spiritual natures that we may live to and for them and not to and for our natural bodies exactly my argument put in long words said mary there will be plenty of time for that when we get down among those old gentlemen yonder a year or two hence you know meanwhile let us take the world as we find it it isn't a bad place after all at times there are several things worth doing for those who are not too lazy good-bye i must be off my bicycle is there against the railings oh how i hate that machine now listen morris do you want to do something really useful and earn the blessings of an affectionate relative then invent a really reliable electrical bike that would look nice and do all the work so that i could sit on it comfortable and get to a place without my legs aching as though i had broken them and a red face and no breath left in my body <laughs> i will think about it he said indeed i have thought of it already but the accumulators are the trouble then go on thinking there's an angel think hard and continually until you evolve that blessed instrument of progression oh i say i haven't a lamp oh i'll lend you mine suggested morris no other people's lamps always go out with me and so do my own for that matter i'll risk it i know the policeman and if we meet i will argue with him good-bye don't forget we are coming to dinner to-morrow night it's a party isn't it oh i believe so what a bore i must unpack my london dresses well good-bye again good-bye dear answered morris and she was gone dear thought mary to herself he hasn't called me that since i was sixteen i wonder why he does it now because i have been scolding him i suppose that generally makes men affectionate for a while she glided forward through the grey twilight and then began to think again muttering to herself oh you idiot mary why should you be pleased because he called you dear he doesn't really care tuppence about you his blood goes no quicker when you pass by and no slower when you stay away oh why do you bother about him and what made you talk all that stuff this afternoon because you think he is in a queer way and that if he goes on giving himself up to these fancies he will become mad yes mad because oh what's the use of making excuses because you are fond of him and always have been fond of him from a child and can't help it oh what a fate to be fond of a man who hasn't the heart to care for you or for any other woman 
Perhaps, however, that's only because he hasn't found the right one, as he might do at any time, and then— "'And where are you going to? And where's your light?' shouted a hoarse voice from the pathway on which he was unlawfully riding. "'Oh, my good man, I wish I knew,' answered Mary blandly. Morris, for whom the day never seemed long enough, was a person who breakfasted punctually at half-past eight, whereas Colonel Monk, to whom, at any rate at Monksland, the day was often too long, generally breakfasted at ten. To his astonishment, however, on entering the dining-room upon the morrow of his interview in the workshop with Mary, he found his father seated at the head of the table. "'Oh, this means a few words with me about something disagreeable,' thought Morris to himself, as he dabbed viciously at the evasive sausage. He was not fond of these domestic conversations, nor was he in the least reassured by his father's airy and informed comments upon the contents of the globe, which always arrived by post and the marvel of his daily turnover article, whereof the perpetual variety throughout the decades constituted, the colonel was wont to say, the eighth wonder of the world. Instinct, instructed by experience, assured him that these were the first moves in the game. Towards the end of the meal he attempted retreat, pretending that he wanted to fetch something, but the colonel, who was watching him over the top of the pink page of the globe, intervened promptly. Oh, "'If you have a few minutes to spare, my dear boy, I should like to have a chat with you,' he said. Oh, "'Certainly, father,' answered the dutiful Morris. "'I am at your service.' "'Oh, very good. Then I would light my cigar, and we might take a stroll on the beach.' "'That is, after I have seen the cook about the dinner to-night. "'Perhaps I shall find you presently uh, down by the steps.' "'I shall wait for you there,' answered Morris. "'And wait he did, for a considerable while, "'for the interview with the cook proved lengthy. "'Moreover, the Colonel was not a punctual person, "'or one who set an undue value upon his own or other people's time.' At length, just as Morris was growing weary of the pristine but enticing occupation of making ducks and drakes with flat pebbles, his father appeared. After salutations, as they say in the East, he wasted ten more minutes in abusing the cook, ending up with a direct appeal for her son's estimate of her capacities. "'Oh, she might be better, she might be worse!' answered Morris judicially. Oh, "'Quite so,' replied the Colonel dryly. "'The remark is sound and applies to most things. At present, however, I think that she is worse. Also I hate the sight of her red, fat face. But bother the cook! Why do you think so much about her? I have something else to say.' "'I don't think,' said Morris, she doesn't excite me one way or the other, except when she is late with my breakfast. Then, as expected, after the cook, came the crisis. "'You will remember, my dear boy,' began the Colonel affectionately, "'a little talk we had a while ago.' Oh, "'Which one, father?' "'The last one of any importance, I believe.' I refer to the occasion when you stopped out all night contemplating the sea, an incident which impressed it upon my memory. Morris looked at him. Why was the old gentleman so inconveniently observant? And doubtless you remember the subject. Oh, there were many good subjects, father. They range from mortgages to matrimony. Ah, quite so, to matrimony. "'Well, have you thought any more about it?' "'Oh, not particularly, father. Why should I?' "'Oh, confound it, Morris!' 
exclaimed the Colonel, losing patience. "'Don't chop logic like a petty session lawyer. Let's come to the point.' "'That is my desire,' answered Morris. And quite clearly there rose up before him an inconsequent picture of his mother teaching him the catechism many, many years ago. Thereat, as was customary with his mind when any memory of her touched it, his temper softened, like iron beneath the influence of fire. "'Very good. Then what do you think of Mary, as a wife? How should I know under the circumstances?' The Colonel fumed, and Morris added, "'I beg your pardon. I understand what you mean.' Then his father came to the charge. "'To be brief, will you marry her?' "'Will she marry me?' asked Morris. "'Isn't she too sensible?' His father's eyes twinkled, but he restrained himself. This, he felt, was not an occasion upon which to indulge his powers of sarcasm. "'Upon my word, if you want my opinion, I believe she will. But you have to ask her first. Oh, look here, my boy, be advised by me, and do it as soon as possible. The notion is rather new to me, I admit, but taking her all round, where would you find a better woman? You and I don't always agree about things. We are of a different generation, and look at the world from different standpoints. But I think that at the bottom we will respect each other, and I am sure, he added with a touch of restrained dignity, that we are naturally and properly attached to each other. Under these circumstances, and taking everything else into consideration, I am convinced also that you will give weight to my advice. I assure you that I do not offer it lightly. It is that you should marry your cousin Mary. There is her side of the case to be considered, suggested Morris. Oh, doubtless, and she is a very shrewd and sensible young woman under all her dolce far niente air, who is quite capable of consideration. I am not worthy of her his son broke in passionately. That is for her to decide. I ask you to give her an opportunity of expressing an opinion. Morris looked at the sea and sky. Then he looked at his father standing before him in an attitude that was almost suppliant, his head bowed, hands clasped, and on his clear-cut face an air of real sincerity. What right had he to resist this appeal? He was heart-whole, without any kind of complication, and for his cousin Mary he had true affection and respect. Moreover, they had been brought up together. She understood him, and in the midst of so much that was uncertain and bewildering she seemed something genuine and solid, something to which a man could cling. It may not have been a right spirit in which to approach this question of marriage, but in the case of a young man like Morris, who was driven forward by no passion, by no scheme even of personal advancement, this substitution of reason for impulse and instinct was perhaps natural. "'Very well, I will.' he answered, but if she is wise, she won't. His father turned his head away and sighed softly, and that sigh seemed to lift a ton's weight off his heart. I am glad to hear it, he answered simply. The rest must settle itself. By the way, if you are going up to the house, tell the cook that I have changed my mind. We will have the soles fried with lemon. She always makes a mess of them, O oh, maitre du hotel. End of chapter 
End of chapter 4 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 5 of Stella Fragelius by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 5 A Proposal and a Promise. Although it consisted of but a dozen people, the dinner party at the Abbey that night was something of a function. To begin with, the old rectory, with its stone columns and arches still standing, as they were in the pre-Reformation days, lit with cunningly arranged and shaded electric lights, designed and set up by Morris, was an absolutely ideal place in which to dine. Then, although the monk family were impoverished, they still retained the store of plate accumulated by past generations. Much of this silver was old and very beautiful, and when they set out upon the great sideboards produced an effect well suited to that chamber and its accessories. The company also was pleasant and presentable. There were the local baronet and his wife, the two beauties of the neighbourhood, Miss Jane Rose and Miss Eliza Layard, with their respective belongings, the clergyman of the parish, Mr. Tomley, who was leaving the county for the north of England on account of his wife's health, and a clever and rising young doctor from the county town. These, with Mr. Pawson and his daughter, made up the number who upon this particular night, with every intention of enjoying themselves, sat down to that rather rare entertainment in Monksland, a dinner-party. Colonel Monk had himself very carefully placed the guests. As a result, Morris, to whose lot it had fallen to take in the wealthy Miss Layard, a young lady of handsome, but somewhat ill-tempered countenance, found himself at the foot of the oblong table with his partner on one side and his cousin on the other. Mary, who was conducted to her seat by Mr. Layard, the delicate brother, an insignificant, pallid-looking specimen of humanity, for reasons of her own, not unconnected, perhaps, with the expected presence of Mrs. Layard and Rose, had determined to look and dress her best that night. She wore a robe of some rich white silk, tight-fitting and cut rather low, and upon her neck a single row of magnificent diamonds. The general effect of her sheeny dress snow-like skin, and golden waving hair, as she glided into the shaded room, suggested to Morris's mind a great white lily floating down the quiet water of some dark stream. And when presently the light fell upon her, a vision of a silver, mist-laden star lying low upon the ocean at the break of dawn. Later, after she became acquainted with these poetical imagings, Mary congratulated herself and her maid very warmly on the fact that she had actually summoned sufficient energy to telegraph to town for this particular dress. Of the other ladies, Miss Layard was arrayed in a hot-looking red garment, which she imagined would suit her dark eyes and complexion. Miss Rose, on the contrary, had come out in the virginal style of muslin and blue bows, whereof the effect, unhappily, was somewhat marred by a fiery complexion, acquired as the result of three days' violent play at a tennis tournament. To this unfortunate circumstance Miss Layard, 
who had her own views of Miss Rose, was not slow in calling attention. Oh, "'What has happened to poor Jane?' she said, addressing Mary. "'She looks as though she has been red ochre down to her shoulders.' "'Who is poor Jane?' asked the young lady languidly. "'Oh, you mean Miss Rose. I know. She has been playing in that tennis tournament at—what's the name of the place? Dad would drive me there this afternoon, and it made me look quite hot to look at her, jumping and running and hitting for hour after hour. But she's awfully good at it. She won the prize. Don't you envy anybody who can win a prize at a tennis tournament, Miss Layard? No, she answered sharply, for Miss Layard did not shine at tennis. I dislike women who go about what my brother calls pot-hunting, just as if they were professionals. Oh, do you? I admire them. It must be so nice to be able to do anything well, even if it's only lawn tennis. It's the poor failures like myself whom I feel sorry for. I don't admire anybody who could come out to a dinner party with a head and a neck like that, retorted Eliza. Why not? You can't burn, and that should make you more charitable. And I tie myself up in veils and umbrellas, which is absurd. Besides, what does it matter? You see, it is different with most of us. Miss Rose is so good-looking that she can afford herself these little luxuries. That is a matter of opinion, replied Miss Layard. Oh, I don't think so. At least the opinion is all one way. Don't you think Miss Rose beautiful, Mr. Layard? She said, turning to her companion. Ripping, said the gentleman with emphasis. But I wish she wouldn't beat that one at tennis. It is an insult to the stronger sex. Mary looked at him reflectively. His sister looked at him also. "'And am I sure that you think her beautiful? Don't you, Morris?' went on the imperturbable Mary. "'Certainly. Of course, lovely,' he replied with a vacuous stare at the elderly wife of the baronet. "'There, Miss Layard, now you collect the opinions of the gentlemen all along your side.' And Mary turned away, ostensibly, to talk to her cavalier but really to find out what could possibly interest Morris so deeply in the person or conversation of Lady Jones. Lady Jones was talking across the table to Mr. Tomley, the departing rector, a benevolent-looking person, with a broad forehead adorned like that of Father Time by a single lock of snowy hair. "'And so you are really going to the far coast of Northumberland, Mr. Tomley, "'to exchange livings with a gentleman with the odd name? "'Oh, how brave of you!' "'Mr. Tomley smiled assent, adding, "'Oh, you can imagine what a blow it is to me, Lady Jones, "'to separate myself from my dear parishioners and friends.' "'Here he eyed the Colonel.' with whom he had waged a continual war during his five years of residence in the parish, and added, "'But we must all give way to the cause of duty and the necessities of health. Mrs. Tomney says that this part of the country does not agree with her, and is quite convinced that unless she is taken back to her native Northumberland air, the worst may be expected. I fancy that it has arrived in that poor man's case.' thought Mary to herself. Lady Jones, who also knew Mrs. Tomley and the power of her tongue, nodded her head sympathetically and said, "'Of course, of course, a wife's health must be the first consideration of every good man. But isn't it rather lonely up there, Mr. Tomley?' "'Lonely, Lady Jones?' the clergyman replied with energy, and shaking his white lock, I assure you that the place is a howling desert, a great moor behind, and the great sea front, and some rocks, and a church between the two. That's about all. 
but my wife likes it because she used to stay at the rectory when she was a little girl her uncle was the incumbent there she declares that she has never been well since she left the parish and what did you say is the name of the present inhabitant of this earthly paradise the man with whom you have exchanged interrupted the colonel eh, eh, fregelius uh, the, the, the reverend peter fregelius uh, what an exceedingly odd name is he an englishman yes but i think that his father was a dane and he married a, a danish lady oh indeed is she living oh no she died a great many years ago the old gentleman has only one child left uh, a girl oh, what is her name asked someone idly in a break of the general conversation so everybody paused to listen to his reply uh, uh, stella a uh, stella fregelius oh a very unusual girl then the conversation broke out again with renewed vigour and all that those at morris's end of the table could catch were snatches such as wonderful eyes independent young person well-read and musical oh yes poor as a church mouse that's why he accepted my offer at this point the doctor began a rather vehement argument with mr Porson as to the advisability of countervailing duties to force foreign nations to abandon the sugar bounties and no more was heard of mr tomley and his plans on the whole mary enjoyed that dinner party miss layard somewhat sore after her first encounter attempted to retaliate later but by this time mary's argumentative energy had evaporated therefore adroitly appealing to mr layard to take her part she retired from the fray till seeing that it grew acrimonious for this brother and sister did not love each other she pretended to hear no more oh, have you been stopping out all night again and staring at the sea morris she inquired because i understand it is a habit of yours you seem so sleepy i know that i must have looked just like you when that old political gentleman took me into dinner and i made an exhibition of myself uh, what was that asked morris so she told him the story of her unlawful slumbers and so amusingly that he burst out laughing and remained in an excellent mood for the rest of the feast or at any rate until the ladies had departed after this event once more he became somewhat silent and distant it was not wonderful to most men except the very experienced proposals are terrifying ordeals and morris had made up his mind if he could find a chance to propose to mary that night the thing was to be done so sooner he did it the better then it would be over one way or the other besides and this was strange and opportune enough never had he felt so deeply and truly attracted to mary whether it was because of her soft indolent beauty showed at its best this evening in that gown and setting or because her conversation with its sub-acid tinge of kindly humour amused him or and this seemed more probable because her whole attitude towards himself was so gentle and so full of sweet benevolence he could not say at any rate this remained true she attracted him more than any woman he had ever met and sincerely he hoped and prayed that when he asked her to be his wife she might find it in her heart to say yes the rest of the entertainment resembled that of most country dinner parties conducted to the piano by the colonel who understood music very well the talented ladies of the party 
including Miss Rose, sang songs with more or less success, while Miss Layard criticised. Mary was appreciative, and men talked. At length the local baronet's wife looked at the local baronet, who thereupon asked leave to order the carriage. This example the rest of the company followed, in quick succession, until all were gone, except Mr. Pawson and his daughter. Uh, uh, "'Well, my dear,' said Mr. Pawson, I, "'I suppose that we had better be off to, or you won't get your customary nine hours.' Mary yawned slightly and assented, asserting that she had utterly exhorted herself in defending Miss Rose from the attacks of her rival, Miss Layard. "'Oh, no, no,' broke in the Colonel. Uh, "'Come and have a smoke first, John. I've got that old map of the property unrolled on purpose to show you, and I don't want to keep it about, for it fills up the whole place.' "'Morris will look after Mary for half an hour or so, I dare say.' "'Certainly,' said Morris, but the heart within him sank to the level of his dress shoes. Here was the opportunity for which he had wished, but as he could not be called a Ford or even a pushing lover, he was alarmed at its very prompt arrival. This answer to his prayers was somewhat too swift and thorough. There is a story of an, an enormously fat old boar, who was seated on the veld with his horse at his side, when suddenly a band of armed natives rushed to attack him. "'Oh, God help!' he cried in his native towel, as he prepared to heave his huge form into the saddle. Having thus invoked divine assistance, this Dutch Falstaff went at the task with such a will that in a trice he found himself not on the horse, but over it, lying on his back, indeed among the grasses. "'Oh, God!' that deluded burgher exclaimed reproachfully as the Kaffirs came up and speared him. "'Thou hast helped me a great deal too much!' At this moment Morris felt very much like this stout but simple dweller in the wilderness. He would have preferred to coquet with an enemy for a while from the safety of his saddle, but Providence willed it otherwise. Uh, "'Won't you come out, Mary?' he said, with the courage which inspires men in desperate situations. He felt that it would be impossible to say these words with the electric lights looking at him like so many eyes. The thought of it, even, made him warm all over. "'Oh, I don't know. It depends. Is there anything comfortable to sit on?' Uh, "'The deck chair,' he suggested. "'Oh, that sounds nice. I have slumbered for hours in deck chairs.' "'Look, there's a fur rug on that sofa, and here's my white cape. "'Now you get your coat, and I'll come.' "'Oh, thank you. No, I don't want any coat. I am hot enough already.' Mary turned and looked him up and down with her wondering blue eyes. "'Do you really think it's safe?' she said. "'To expose yourself to all sorts of unknown dangers in this unprotected condition?' Oh, of course, he answered. I am not afraid of the night air, even in October. Oh, very well, very well, Morris, she went on, and there was meaning in her voice. Then whatever happens, don't blame me. It's so easy to be rash and thoughtless and catch a chill, and then you may become an invalid for life, or die, you know. One can't get rid of it again, at least not often. Morris looked at her with a puzzled air, and stepped through the window which he had opened, on to the lawn. Whither, with a quaint little shrug of her shoulders, Mary followed him, muttering to herself, Now if it takes cold it won't be my fault. Then she stopped, clasped her hands, and said, Oh, what a lovely night! 
I am glad that we came out here. She was right. It was indeed lovely. High in the heavens floated a bright half-moon, across whose face the little white-edged clouds drifted in quick succession, throwing their gigantic shadows to the world beneath. All silver was the sleeping sea where the moonlight fell upon it, and when this was eclipsed then it was all jet. To the right and left, up to the very borders of the cliff, lay the soft wreaths of rogue or land fog, covering the earth as with a cloak of down, but pierced here and there by the dim and towering shapes of trees. Yet although these curling wreaths of mist hung on the edges of the cliff like white water about to fall, they never fell, since clear to the sight, though separated from them by a gulf of translucent blackness, lay the yellow belt of sand, up which, inch by inch, the tide was creeping. And the air! No wind stirred, though the wind was at work aloft. It was still and bright as crystal, and crisp and cold as new iced wine, for the first autumn frost was falling. They stood for a few moments looking at all these wonderful beauties of the mysterious night, which dwellers in the country so rarely appreciate, because to them they are common daily things. And listening to the soft, long-drawn murmuring of the sea upon the shingle, then they went forward to the edge of the cliff. But although Morris threw the fur rug over it, Mary did not seat herself upon the comfortable-looking deck-chair. Her desire for repose had departed. She preferred to lean upon the low grey wall in whose crannies grew lichens, tiny ferns, and in their season harebells and wallflowers. Morris came and leant at her side. For a while they both stared at the sea. "'Pray, are you making up poetry?' she inquired at last. "'Oh, why do you ask such silly questions?' he answered, not without indignation. "'Because you keep muttering to yourself, and I thought that you were trying to get lines to scan. Also the sea and the sky and the night, they suggest poetry, don't they?' Morris turned his head and looked at her. "'You suggest it,' he said, with desperate earnestness, "'in all that shining white, especially when the moon goes in. "'Then you look like a beautiful spirit, new-lit upon the edge of the world.' "'At first Mary was pleased. "'The compliment was obvious, and coming from Morris, great. "'She had never heard him say so much as that before. "'Then she thought of an instant and the echo of the word spirit came back to her mind and jarred upon it with a little sudden shock even when he had a lovely woman at his side must his fancy be wandering to those unearthly denizens and similes oh please morris she said almost sharply do not compare me to a spirit i am a woman nothing more and if it is not enough that I should be a woman, then— She paused to add, I beg your pardon, I know you meant to be nice, but once I had a friend who went in for spirits, table-turning ones, I mean, with very bad results, and I detest the name of them. Morris took this rebuff better than might have been expected. "'Would you object if one ventured to call you an angel?' he asked. "'Well, not if the word was used in a terrestrial sense. "'It excites a vision of possibilities, and the fib is so big that anyone must pardon it. "'Very well, then, I call you that.' "'Thank you. 
I should be delighted to return the compliment. Can you think of any celestial definition appropriate to a young gentleman with dark eyes? Oh, Mary, please stop making fun of me, said Morris, with something of a groan. Why? she asked innocently. Besides, I wasn't making fun. It's only my way of carrying on conversation. They taught me it at school, you know. Morris made no answer. In fact, he did not know what on earth to say, or rather how to find the fitting words. After all, it was an accident, and not his own intelligence that freed him from his difficulty. Mary moved a little, causing the white cloak, which was unfastened, to slip from her shoulders. Morris put out his hand to catch it, and met her hand. In another instant he had thrown his arms round her, drawn her to him, and kissed her upon the lips. Then, abashed at what he had done, he let her go and picked up the cloak. Uh, um, "'Might I ask?' began Mary, in her usual sweet, low tones. Then her voice broke, and her blue eyes filled with tears. "'Oh, I beg your pardon. I am a brute.' began Morris, utterly abashed by the sight of these tears, which glimmered like pearls in the moonlight. But, of course, y you know what I mean. Mary shook her head vacantly. Apparently she could not trust herself to speak. Dear, will you take me? She made no answer. Only, after pausing for some few seconds, as though lost in thought, with a little action, more eloquent than any speech, she lent herself ever so slightly towards him. Afterwards, as she lay in his arms, words came to him readily enough. "'I am not worthy your having,' he said. "'I know I am an odd fellow, not like other men. My very failings have not been the same as other men's. For instance—' before heaven it is true you are the first woman whom i have ever kissed as i swear to you that you shall be the last then what else am i a failure in the very work that i have chosen and the heir to a bankrupt property oh it is not fair i have no right to ask you i think it is quite fair and here i am the judge morris then sentence by sentence she went on, not all at once, but with breaks and pauses. You asked me just now if I loved you, and I told you, yes. But you did not ask me when I began to love you. I will tell you all the same. I can't remember a time when I didn't. No, not since I was a little girl. It was you who grew away from me, not me from you. When you took to studying mysticism and aerophones, and were repelled by all women, myself included. I know, I know, he said. Don't remind me of my dead follies. Some things are born in the blood. Oh, quite so. And they remain in the bone. I understand. Morris, unless you maltreat me willfully, which I am sure you would never do, I shall always understand. What are you afraid of? he asked in a shaken voice. I feel that you are afraid. Oh, one or two things, that you might overwork yourself, for instance or lest you should find that, after all, you are more human than you imagine, and be taken possession of by some strange Stella coming out of nowhere. "'What do you mean, and why do you use that name?' he said, amazed. "'What I say, dear. As for that name, I heard it accidentally at table to-night, and it just came to my lips, of itself. It seemed to typify what I meant.' 
and to suggest a wandering star, such as men like you are fond of following. Upon my honour, said Morris, I will do none of these things. Well, if you can help it, you will do none of them. I know it well. I hope and believe that there will never be a shadow between us while we live. But, Morris, I take you, risks and all, because it has been my chance to love you and nobody else. Otherwise, I should think twice. But love doesn't stop at risks. Oh, what have I done to deserve this? groaned Morris. I cannot see. I should very much like to know, replied Mary, with a touch of her old humour. It was at this moment that Colonel Monk, happening to come round the corner of the house, walking on the grass, and followed by Mr. Pawson, saw a light which interested him. With one hand he pointed it out to Pawson, at the same moment motioning him to silence with the other. Then, taking his brother-in-law by the arm, he dragged him back round the corner of the house. Uh, uh, "'They make a pretty picture there in the moonlight there, don't they, John, my boy?' he said. "'Come, we had better go back into the study and talk over matters until they have done.' Even the warmth of their emotions won't keep out the night air for ever. End of chapter five. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter six of Stella Fragelius by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter six The Good Old Days. For the next month, or to be accurate, the next five weeks, everything went merrily at Monk's Abbey. It was as though some cloud had been lifted off the place, and those who dwelt within. No longer did the Colonel look solemn when he came down in the morning and no longer was he cross after he read his letters. Now his interviews with the steward in the study were neither prolonged nor anxious. Indeed, that functionary emerged thence on Saturday mornings with a shining countenance, drying the necessary cheque, heretofore so difficult to extract, by waving it ostentatiously in the air. Lastly, the Colonel did not seem to be called upon to make such frequent visits to his man of business, and to tarry at the office of the bank manager in Northwold. Once there was a meeting, but contrary to the general custom, the lawyer and the banker came to see him in company, and stopped a luncheon. At this meal, moreover, the three of them appeared to be in the best of spirits. Morris noticed all these things in his quiet, observant way, and from them drew certain conclusions of his own. But he shrank from making inquiries, nor did the Colonel offer any confidences. After all, why should he, who had never meddled in his father's business, choose this moment to explore it, especially as he knew from previous experience that such investigations would not be well received? It was one of the Colonel's peculiarities to keep his affairs to himself until they grew so bad that circumstances forced him to seek the counsel or the aid of others. Still, Morris could well guess from what mine the money was digged that caused so comfortable a change in their circumstances, and the solution of this mystery gave him little joy. Cash in consideration of an unconcluded marriage. That was how it read. To his sensitive nature, the transaction seemed one of doubtful worth. 
However, no one else appeared to be troubled, if indeed these things existed elsewhere than in his own imagination. This, Morris admitted, was possible, for the access of prosperity might, after all, be no more than a resurrection of credit, vivified by the news of his engagement with the only child of a man known to be wealthy. His uncle Porson, with a solemnity that was almost touching, had bestowed upon Mary and himself a jerky but earnest blessing before he drove home on the night of the dinner-party. He went so far, indeed, as to kiss them both, an example which the Colonel followed with a more finished but equally heartfelt grace. Now his uncle John beamed upon him daily like the noonday sun. Also he began to take him into his confidence, and consult him as to the erection of houses, affairs of business, and investments. In the course of these interviews Morris was astonished, not to say dismayed, to discover how long were the sums of money as to the disposal of which he was expected to express opinions. Uh, uh, you see, it will all be yours, my boy, said Mr. Porson one day in explanation. So it is best that you should know something of these affairs. Yes, it will all be yours uh, before very long. And he sighed. I trust that I shall have nothing to do with it for many years, blurted out Morris. Oh, uh, say months, say months, answered his uncle, stretching out his hands as though to push something from him. Then to all appearances, overcome by a sudden anguish, physical or mental, he turned and hurried from the room. Taking them all together, those five weeks were the happiest that Morris had ever known. No longer was he profoundly dissatisfied with things in general, no longer ravaged by the desire of the moth for the star which in some natures is almost a disease. His outlook upon the world was healthier and more hopeful. For the first time he saw its wholesome, joyful side. Had he failed to do so, indeed, he must have been a very strange man, for he had much to make the poorest heart rejoice. Thus Mary, always a charming woman, since her engagement had become absolutely delightful, wittier, more wide-awake, more beautiful. Morris could look forward to the years to be spent in her company, not only without misgiving, but with a confidence that a while ago he would have thought impossible. Moreover, as good fortunes never come singly, his were destined to be multiplied. It was in those days after so many years of search and unfruitful labour that at last he discovered a clue which in the end resulted in the perfection of the instrument that was the parent of the aerophone of commerce, and gave him a name among the inventors of the century which will not easily be forgotten. Strangely enough, it was Morris's good genius, Mary, who suggested the substance, or rather the mixture of substances, whereof the portion of the aerophone was finely constructed, which is still known as Monk Sound Waves Receiver. Whether, as she alleged, she had made the discovery by pure accident, or whether, as seems possible, she had thought the problem out in her own feminine fashion, with results that proved excellent. It does not matter in the least. The issue remains the same. An apparatus, which before would only work on rare occasions, and then without any certitude, between people of the highest state of sympathy or nervous excitement, has now been brought to such a stage of perfection that by its means anybody can talk to anybody, even if their interests are antagonistic, or their personal enmity bitter. After the first few experiments of this new material, Morris was not slow to discover that although it would need long and careful testing and elaboration, for him it meant, in the main, 
the realization of his great dream and success after years of failure and that was the strange part of it this realization and success he owed to no effort of his own but to some chance suggestion made by mary he told her this and thanked her as a man thanks one through whom he has found salvation in answer she merely laughed saying that she was nothing but the wire along which a happy inspiration had reached his brain and that more than this she neither wished nor hoped nor was capable of being then suddenly on this happy tranquil atmosphere which wrapped about them like the sound of a passing bell at a child's feast floated the first note of impending doom and death the autumn held fine and mild and mary who had been lunching at the abbey was playing croquet with morris upon the side lawn this game was the only one for which she chanced to care perhaps because it did not involve much exertion morris who engaged in the pastime with the same earnestness that he gave to every other pursuit in which he happened to be interested was as might be expected getting the best of the encounter won't you take a couple of bisques my dear he said affectionately after a while i don't always like beating you by such a lot i'd die first she answered bisques are a badge of advertised inferiority and the mark of the giver's contempt oh stuff said morris stuff indeed as though it wasn't bad enough to be beaten at all but to be beaten with bisques oh that's another argument first you say you are too proud to accept them and next that you won't accept them because it is worse to be defeated with points than without them anyway if you had the commonest feeling of humanity you wouldn't beat me replied mary adroitly shifting her ground for the third time well how can i help you if you won't have any bisques how by pretending that you are doing your best and letting me win all the same of course though if i caught you at it i should be furious oh but what's the use of trying to teach a blunt creature like you tact my dear morris i assure you i do not believe that your efforts at deception were taking the simplest-minded cow why even dad sees through you and the person who can't impose upon my dad oh she added suddenly in a changed voice uh, there is george coming through the gate something has happened to my father uh, look at his face morris look at his face in another moment the footman stood before them oh please miss the master he began and hesitated uh, not dead said mary in a slow quiet voice do not say that he is dead oh no miss but he has had a stroke of the heart or something and the doctor thought you had better be fetched so i have bought the carriage oh come with me morris she said as dropping the croquet mallet she flew rather than ran to the brougham ten minutes later they were at seaview in the hall they met mr charters the doctor why was he leaving because oh no no he said answering their looks the danger is past he seems almost well as ever oh thank g god stammered mary then a thought struck her and she looked up sharply and asked w will it come back again oh yes was his straightforward answer when oh from time to time at irregular periods but in its fatal shape i hope well not for some years oh, the verdict might have been worse dear said morris yes yes but to think it has passed so near him and he quite alone at the time morris morris she went on turning to him with an energy that was almost fierce 
if you won't have my father to live with us i won't marry you do you understand oh oh perfectly dear you leave no room for misconception by all means let him live with us well if he can get on with my father he added meaningfully ah she replied i never thought of that also i should not have spoken so roughly but i have had such a shock and i feel inclined to treat you like 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 a toad under a harrow oh so please be sympathetic and don't misunderstand me or i don't know what i shall say then by way of making amends mary put her arms round his neck and gave him a kiss all of her own cord saying morris i am afraid i am afraid i feel i feel as if our good time was done after this the servant came that she might go up to the father's room and that scene of our drama was at an end mr pawson owned a villa at beaulieu in the south of france which he had built many years before as a winter house for his wife whose chest was weak here he was in the habit of spending the spring months more perhaps because of the associations which the place possessed for him than of any affection for foreign lands now however after his last attack three doctors in consultation announced that it would be well for him to escape from the fogs and damp of england so to beaulieu he was ordered this decree caused consternation in various quarters mr pawson did not wish to go mary and morris were cast down for simple and elementary reasons and colonel monk found this change of plan it had been arranged that the portion should stop at Seaview till the new year, which was to be the day of the marriage. Inconvenient and, indeed, disturbing. Once those young people were parted, reflected the Colonel in his wisdom, who could tell what might or might not happen? In this difficulty he found an inspiration. Why should not the wedding take place at once? very diplomatically he sounded his brother-in-law to find he had no opposition to fear in this quarter provided that mary and her husband would join him at beaulieu after a week or two of honeymoon then he spoke to morris who was delighted with the idea for morris had come to the conclusion that the marriage state would be better and more satisfactory than one of prolonged engagement it only remained therefore to obtain the consent of mary which would perhaps have been given without much difficulty had her uncle been content to leave his son or mr pawson to ask it of her as it chanced this he was not willing to do pawson he was sure would at once give way should his daughter raise any objection and in morris's tact and persuasive powers the colonel had no faith in the issue confident in his own diplomatic abilities he determined to manage the affairs himself and to speak to his niece the mistake was grave for whereas she was wax to her father or her lover something in her uncle's manner or it may have been his very personality always aroused in mary a spirit of opposition on this occasion too that manner was not fortunate for he put the proposal before her as a thing already agreed upon by all concerned and one to which her consent was asked as a matter of form instantly mary became antagonistic she pretended not to understand she asked for reasons and explanations finally she announced in idle words beneath which ran a current of determination that neither her father nor morris could really wish this hurried marriage since had they done so one or the other of them would have spoken to her on the subject when pressed she intimated very politely but in language whereof the meaning could hardly be mistaken 
that she held this fixing of the date to be peculiarly her own privilege, and when she still further pressed, said plainly that she considered her father too ill for her to think of being married at present. "'Oh, but they both desire it!' expostulated the Colonel. "'They have not told me so,' Mary answered, setting her red lips. "'Well, if that is all, they will tell you soon enough, my dear girl.' "'Well, perhaps, uncle, after they had been directed to do so, but that is not quite the same thing.' The Colonel saw that he had made a mistake, and too late changed his tactics. "'Oh, uh, you see, Mary, your father's state of health is precarious. He might grow worse.' She tapped her foot on the ground. Of these allusions to the possible, and indeed the certain end of her beloved father's illness, she had a kind of horror. "'In that event, that dreadful event,' she answered, he will need me, my whole time, and care to nurse him. These I might not be able to give if I were already married. I love Morris very dearly. I am his for whatever I may be worth. But I was my father's before my Morris came into my life, and he has the first claim upon me. Well, what then do you propose? asked the Colonel curtly for opposition and argument bred no meekness in his somewhat arbitrary breast. To be married on New Year's Day, wherever we are, if Morris wishes it and the state of my father's health makes it convenient, if not Uncle Richard, to wait till a more fitting season. Then she rose, for this conversation took place at Seaview saying that it was time she should give her father his medicine. Thus the project of an early marriage fell through, for having once been driven into announcing her decision in terms so open and unmistakable, Mary would not go back on her word. Morris, who was much disappointed, pleaded with her. Her father also spoke upon the subject, but though the voice was the voice of Mr. Pawson, the arguments, she perceived, were the arguments of Colonel Monk. Therefore she hardened her heart and put the matter by, refusing, indeed, to discuss it at any length. Yet, and it is not the first time that a woman has allowed her whims to prevail over her secret wishes. In truth, she desired nothing more than to be married to Morris so soon as it was his will to take her. Finally, a compromise was arranged. There was to be no wedding at present, but the whole party were to go together to Bewley, there to await the development of events. It was arranged, moreover, by all concerned, that unless something unforeseen occurred to prevent it, the marriage should be celebrated upon or about New Year's Day. End of chapter 6 Recording by Patrick 79Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter seven. Bewley. Beautiful as it might be, and fashionable as it might be, Morris did not find Bewley very entertaining. Indeed, in an unguarded moment, he confessed to Mary that he hated the whole. Even the steam launch in which they went for picnics did not console him, fond though he was of the sea. While as for Monte Carlo, after his third visit he was heard to declare that if they wanted to take him there again it must be in his coffin. The Colonel did not share these views. He was out for a holiday, and he meant to enjoy himself. To begin with, there was the club at Nice, 
where he fell in with several old comrades and friends. Then whom should he meet but Lady Rawlins? Once for a little while in the distant past they had been engaged, until suddenly the young lady, a beauty in her day, jilted him in favour of a wealthy banker of Hebraic origin. Now, many years after, the banker was aged, violent, and uncomely, habitually exceeded in his cups, and abused his wife before the servants. So it came about that to the poor woman the colonel's courteous, if somewhat sarcastic, consolations were received very welcome. It pleased him also to offer them. The jilting he had long ago forgiven indeed. He blessed her nightly for having taken the view of her obligations, seeing that Jane Millet, as she was then, however pretty her face may have once been, had neither fortune nor connections. Uh, "'Yes, my dear Jane,' he said to her confidentially one afternoon, "'I assure you I often admire your foresight. Now, if you had done the other thing, where should we have been to-day? In the workhouse, I imagine.' "'I suppose so,' answered Lady Rawlins meekly and suppressing a sigh, since for the courtly and distinguished colonel she cherished a sentimental admiration which actually increased with age. But you don't always think like that, do you, Richard? Then she glanced out of the window, and added, Oh, there is Jonah coming home, and he looks so cross. And the poor lady shivered. The colonel put up his eyeglass and contemplated Jonah through the window. He was not a pleasing spectacle, a rather low-class Hebrew who calls himself a Christian, of unpleasant appearance and sinister temper, suffering from the effects of lunch, is not an object to be loved. "'Ah, I see,' said the colonel. "'Yes, uh, Sir Jonah ages, doesn't he? "'Well, as indeed we do all of us.' "'And he glanced at the lady's spreading proportions. "'Then he went on. "'You really should persuade him to be tidier in his costume, Jane. "'His ancestral namesake could scarcely have looked more dishevelled "'after his sojourn with the whale.' "'Well, it is a small failing. "'One can't have everything. "'And on the whole, with your wealth and the rest, "'you have been a very fortunate woman.' "'Oh, Richard, how can you say so?' "'murmured the wretched Lady Rawlins, "'as she took the hand outstretched in farewell. "'For Jonah, in large doses, "'was more than the Colonel could stomach.' Indeed, as the door closed behind him, she wiped away a tear, whispering to herself, And to think that I threw over dear Richard in order to marry that, that, yes, I will say it, that horror. Meanwhile, as he strolled down the street, beautifully dressed and still looking very upright and handsome, for he had never lost his figure. The colonel was saying to himself, Oh, silly old woman! Well, I hope that by now she knows the difference between a gentleman and a half-Christianized, money-hunting, wine-bibbing Jew. However, she's got the fortune, which was what she wanted, although she forgets it now, and he's got a lacrimose, stout, old party. But how beautiful she used to be, my word, how beautiful she used to be. To go to see her now is better than any sermon. It is an admirable moral exercise. 
to lady rawlins also the colonel's visit proved excellent moral exercises tinged with chastenings whenever he went he left behind him some aphorism or reflection filled with a wholesome bitter but still she sought his society and in secret adored him in addition to the club and lady rawlings there were the tables at monte carlo with their motley company which to a man of the world could not fail to be amusing besides the colonel had one weakness sometimes he did a little gambling and when he played he liked to play fairly high morris accompanied him once to the salle de jeu and that was enough what passed there exactly could never be got out of him even by mary whose sense of humour was more than satisfied with the little comedies in progress about her no single point of which did she ever miss only funny as she might be in her general feebleness and badly as she might have behaved in some distant past for lady rawlings she felt sorry her kind heart told mary that this unhappy person also possessed a heart although she was now stout and on the wrong side of middle age she was aware too that the colonel knew as much and his scientific pinpricks and searings of that guileless and unprotected organ struck her as a little short of cruel none the less so indeed because the victim at the stake imagined that they were inflicted in kindness by the hand of a still tender and devoted friend i hope that i shan't quarrel with my father-in-law reflected mary to herself after one of these exhibitions he's got an uncommonly long memory and likes to come even however i never shall because he's afraid of me and knows that i see through him mary was right a very sincere respect for her martial powers when roused ensured perfect peace between her and the colonel with his son however it was otherwise even in this age of the triumph of the offspring parents do exist who take advantage of their son's strict observance of the fifth commandment it is easy to turn a man into a moral bolster and sit upon him if you know that an exaggerated sense of filial duty will prevent him from stuffing himself with pins so it came about that morris was sometimes sat upon especially when the colonel was suffering from a bad evening at the tables well out of sight and hearing of mary be it understood who on such occasions was apt to develop a quite formidable temper it is over this question of the tables that one of these domestic differences arose which in its results brought about the return of the monks to monksland upon a certain afternoon the colonel asked his son to accompany him to monte carlo morris refused rather curtly perhaps very well replied the colonel in his grandest manner i am sure i do not wish for an unwilling companion and doubtless your attention is claimed by affairs more important than the according of your company to a father no replied morris with his accustomed truthfulness i am going out sea-fishing that is all quite so allow me then to wish good luck to your fishing does mary accompany you oh no i don't think so she says that boats make her sick and she can't bear eels oh so much the better as i can ask for the pleasure of her society this afternoon yes you can ask said morris suddenly turning angry do you imply morris that the request will be refused certainly father if i have anything to do with it and might i inquire why because i won't have mary taken to that place to mix with the people who frequent it i see this is exclusiveness with a vengeance 
perhaps you consider that those unholy doors should be shut to me also i have no right to express an opinion as to where my father should or should not go but if you ask me i think that under all circumstances you should do your best to keep away the circumstances what circumstances those of our poverty which leaves us no money to risk in gambling then the colonel lost all control of his temper as sometimes happened to him and became exceedingly violent and unpleasant what he said does not matter let it suffice that the remarks were of a character which even headstrong men are accustomed to reserve for the benefit of their women-folk and other intimate relations attracted by the noise which was considerable mary came in to find her uncle marching up and down the room vituperating morris who with quite a new expression upon his face a quiet dogged kind of expression was leaning upon a mantelpiece and watching him uncle began mary would you mind being a little quieter my father is asleep upstairs and i am afraid that you will wake him oh i am sorry my dear very sorry but there are some insults that no man with self-respect can submit to even from a son insults insults repeated mary opening her blue eyes then looking at him with pained air morris why do you insult your father insult he replied then i will tell you how my father wanted to take you to play with him at monte carlo this afternoon and i said that you shouldn't go that's the insult you observe my dear broke in the colonel that already he treats you as one having authority yes said mary and why shouldn't he now that my father is so weak who am i to obey if not morris oh well well said the colonel diplomatically beginning to cool for he could control his temper when he liked every one to their taste but some matters are so delicate that i prefer not to discuss them and he looked round for his hat by this time however the cyclonic conditions of things had affected mary also and she determined that he should not escape so easily uh, before you go she went on in her slow voice i should like to say uncle that i quite agree with morris i don't think those tables are quite the place to take young ladies to especially if the gentleman with them is much engaged in play indeed indeed then you are both of a mind which is quite as it should be of course too upon such matters of conduct and etiquette we must all bow to the taste and the experience of the young even those of us who have mixed with the world for forty years might i ask my dear mary if you have any further word of advice for me before i go yes uncle replied mary calmly i advise you not to lose so much of of your money or to sit up so late at night which you know never agrees with you also i wish you wouldn't abuse morris for nothing because he doesn't deserve it and i don't like it and if we are all to live together after i am married it will be so much more comfortable if we can come to an understanding first then muttering something beneath his breath about ladies in general and this young lady in particular the colonel departed with speed mary sat down in an armchair and fanned herself with a pocket handkerchief oh thinking of the right thing to say always makes me hot she remarked well if by the right thing you mean the strong thing you certainly discovered it replied morris looking at her with affectionate admiration i know but it had to be done dear he's losing a lot of money which is mere waste 
Here Morris groaned, but asked no questions. Besides, and her voice became earnest, I will not have him talking to you like that. The fact that one man is the father of another doesn't give him the right to abuse him like a pickpocket. Also, if you are so good that you put up with it, I have myself to consider. That is, if we are all to live as a happy family. Do you understand? Oh, perfectly, said Morris. I dare say you are right, but I hate rows. So do I, and that is why I have accepted one or two challenges to single combat quite at the beginning of things. You mark my words. He will be like a lamb at breakfast to-morrow. Oh, you shouldn't speak disrespectfully of my father. Well, at any rate, to me, suggested the old-fashioned Morris rather mildly. No, dear, and when I have learned to respect him, I promise you that I won't. There, oh, don't be vexed with me. But my Uncle Richard makes me cross, and then I scratch. As he said the other day, all women are like cats. When they are young they play, and when they get old they use their claws. I quote Uncle Richard, and although I am not old yet, I can't help showing the claws. But Dad is ill. That is the fact of it, Morris, and it gets upon my nerves. Oh, I thought he was better, love. Yes, he is better. He may live for years. I hope and believe that he will, but it is terribly uncertain. And now look here, Morris. Why don't you go home? Oh, do you want to get rid of me, love? He asked, looking up. Oh, no, I don't. You know that, I am sure. But what is the use of your stopping here? There is nothing for you to do, and I feel that you are wasting your time and that you hate it. Oh, go on, tell the truth. Don't you long to be back at Monksland, working at the aerophone? Well, I should be glad to get on with my experiments, but I, I don't like leaving you, he answered. But you had better leave me for a while. It is not comfortable for you idling here, particularly when your father is in an uncertain temper. If all be well, in another couple of months or so, we shall come together for good, and be able to make our own arrangements according to circumstances. Till then, if I were you, I should go home, especially as I can find that I can get on with my uncle much better when you are not here. Then what is to happen after we marry, and I can't be sent away? Oh, who knows? But if we are not comfortable at Monk's Abbey, we can always set up for ourselves. With Dad at Seaview, for instance. He's peaceable enough. Besides, he must be looked after. And to be frank, my uncle hectors him. Oh, poor dear! I will think it over, said Morris. And now, come for a walk on the beach, and we will forget all these worries. Next morning the Colonel appeared at breakfast in a perfectly angelic frame of mind, having to all appearance utterly forgotten the contretemps of the previous afternoon. Perhaps this was policy, or perhaps the fact of his having won several hundred pounds the night before mollified his mood. At least it had become genial, and he proved a most excellent companion. Uh, "'Look here, old fellow,' he said to Morris, throwing him a letter across the table. "'If you have nothing to do for a week or so, I wish you would save an aged parent a journey.' and settle up this job with Simpkins. Morris read the letter. It had to do with the complete re-erection of the set of buildings on the Abbey Farm, and the putting up of a certain drainage mill. 
Over this question, differences had arisen between the agent Simpkins and the rural authorities, who alleged that the said mill would interfere with an established right of way. Indeed, things had come to such a point that if a lawsuit was to be avoided, the presence of a principal was necessary. Oh, Simpkins is a quarrelsome ass, explained the Colonel, and somebody will have to smooth those fellows down. Will you go? Because if you won't, I must, and I don't want to break into the first pleasant holiday I have had for five years. Oh, thanks to your kindness, my dear John. Certainly I will go if necessary answered Morris, but I thought you told me a few months ago that it was quite impossible to execute those alterations, on account of the expense. Oh, yes, yes, but I have consulted with your uncle here, and the matter has been arranged, hasn't it, dear John? Mr. Pawson was seated at the end of the table, and Morris, looking at him, noticed with a shock how old he had suddenly become. His plump, cheerful face had fallen in. The cheeks were quite hollow now. His jaws seemed to protrude, and the skin upon his bald head to be drawn quite tight, like the parchment on a drum. Uh, of course, uh, of course, Colonel, he answered, lifting his chin from his breast, upon which it was resting. Uh, arranged, uh, uh, quite satisfactorily arranged. Then he looked about rather vacantly, for his mind, it was clear, was far away, and added, uh, Do you want, uh, I, I mean, were you talking about the new drainage mill for the salt marshes? Mary interrupted and explained. Uh, yes, yes, how stupid of me. I am afraid I am getting a little deaf, and this air makes me so sleepy in the morning. Now, uh, just tell me again, what is it? And Mary explained further. Morris to go and see about it? Well, well, why shouldn't he? It doesn't take long to get home nowadays. Not but that we shall be sorry to lose you, my dear boy, or at least one of us will be sorry. And he tried to wink in his old jovial fashion, and chuckled feebly. Mary saw and sighed, while the Colonel shook his head portentously. Nobody could play the part of Job's comforter to greater perfection. The end of it was that, after a certain space of hesitation, Morris agreed to go. This menage at Bewley oppressed him, and he hated the place. Besides, Mary, seeing that he was worried, almost insisted on his departure. "'If I want you back, I will send for you,' she said. "'Go to your work, dear. You will be happier.' So he kissed her fondly, and went, as he was fated to go. Uh, "'Good-bye, my dear son,' said Mr. Pawson. Sometimes he called him his son now. "'I hope that I shall see you again soon, and if I don't, you will be kind to my daughter Mary, won't you? You understand, Everybody else is dead. My wife is dead. My boy is dead. And soon I shall be dead. So naturally I think a good deal about her. You will be kind to her, won't you? Good-bye, my son, and don't trouble about money. Uh, there, there, there is plenty. End of chapter 7 Recording by Patrick 79